a great song to, uh, to end on before we start this last sermon in our series on the disciplines of grace because really treasuring Christ is what all this is really all about. The reason we talk about these different disciplines this summer, the ways that we can seek after God, love God, train ourselves in the grace that he's given us is so that we can know him as our treasure. Well, let me start by asking you this morning, what's the greatest party you have ever been to? Was it one that you put on or someone else organized for you? Can you remember what it was like? I remember the greatest party I ever went to. It is without question my wedding day. It was amazing. I've got a picture here from my wedding day. My uh, wife looked much prettier than I did, which is why my nephew looks horrified looking at me. Um, and I'm going to have to talk about the trauma of that at some point in his life. But I love my wedding. It was the best day of my life. We had all of our friends there, all of our family there. We were singing. We were dancing. I actually love this day so much. There were so many great things happening. I misremember it sometimes. This week when I was planning a sermon on celebration, I said to Janae, you know, I, we should talk, I should talk about my wedding, right? Because that was the best party we went to. And I said, do you remember those chocolate fountains that we had? She said, we didn't have chocolate fountains at our wedding. And so I was devastated to hear that. I could, I could remember tasting various things dipped in chocolate at our wedding. But apparently it was so good that I misremember it. But one of my other favorite parts of the day is at the reception, we had the speeches. Speeches were always beautiful, funny. Uh, there was one particular really touching speech from Janae's dad. And he said how the whole summer he'd watched his daughter count down to her wedding day. I'm going to be marrying my best friend in 30 days, 20 days, 10 days. And how in the same summer he'd watched his future son-in-law count down on social media to the release of the new Superman movie. Seven days till Man of Steel. Right, a good contrast between the quality uh, of the wife and the husband there. But without question, my favorite thing at weddings is dancing. I'm a little sad that I've got less people in my life getting married now because I love going to the dance floor at wedding receptions. Uh, but British people are not known for being the best dancers because the politeness we have, it kind of transfers into the rest of our body. And there's almost this magnetic field that keeps all limbs tight in. So you can only dance like this if you're British because you're afraid of what everyone's going to think. But Americans... Americans are different, right? This is one person, our friend Tim, dancing at our wedding. All right, he's having a good time, right? You could film America's Next Top Dance Crew out at our wedding. It was great. But people love celebration, right? It might be the wedding for you. It might be a birthday party. It might be the birth of one of your kids. It might be just a celebration of someone's retirement. There's all kinds of celebrations that we have. And I think one of the things that sometimes we neglect as believers is this idea that celebration is actually a really deeply spiritual experience. That actually celebration is one of the fundamental parts of being a follower of Christ. Because every time that we celebrate, in all the different ways that we celebrate, we're actually coming close to a picture of what the kingdom of God is really like. Every time we celebrate and let the joy that is in us out over the various things in our life, there's something about that that echoes what God is really all about. I want to read to you a verse from the book of Nehemiah that kind of captures what I think the heart of celebration is really all about. It says this in Nehemiah 12, 43, they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. That's the kind of celebration that God wants us all to be a part of. That's what his design is for us. And it's fitting, I think, that we end this series on, on the disciplines of grace with celebration because all those disciplines we've talked about, when we put them into practice in our lives, they're always going to lead us towards celebration. Because all of those disciplines in the different ways that we practice them, they're all about letting out of us and practicing what brings us most joy, being with Jesus, knowing his grace. See, celebration is this. A simple way to think about celebration is that celebration is the outward expression of our joy in someone or something. Celebration is the outward expression of our joy in someone or something. So today we're gonna to talk about God's design, God's hope, God's gift of celebration in three ways. Firstly, how God has created us to celebrate as a people, how he has called us to celebrate as a church, and how he is preparing us to celebrate as his people. So let's talk about that first one, how he created us to celebrate. Now as I was thinking this week again about different ways we can think about celebration, talk about celebration. I was given a gift by social media because I realized it was National Dog Day this week. How many people posted a picture of their dog on Facebook? 
right? People have been a little bit shy about putting your hands up. I know there must be a ton of people because I saw like 5,000 dogs this week on Facebook. I, there was people I didn't even know had dogs and they were sharing pictures, right? And there's these days throughout the American calendar, which I'm very appreciative of, that we get to celebrate different things. We've got National Sibling Day, where everybody likes to post pictures and remind everyone how much cooler they are than their brother or sister. We've got, uh, m- one of my favorites is National Star Wars Day on May the 4th, because May the 4th be with you, right? <laughs> it's f- days for nerds like me to exercise the things that you love and, and the things you've got joy in. But there is also a group of national days every year that I really don't have any kind of explanation for. For example, did you know that this coming Monday, September 2nd, tomorrow is National Blueberry Popsicle Day? Who was the guy that decided blueberry popsicles needed a whole day? What about cherry, man? I really like cherry popsicles. Or there is a national talk like a pirate day, which is actually an international holiday. If you go on to, uh, it's, it's September as well. If you go on to Facebook, on September 19th, they'll actually change some of the language on their web pages to be more piratey. So I, again, who, the, who was the guy that came up with that? I don't know. But my favorite one that I think we should all celebrate, a very important holiday, December 18th, National Answer the Phone Like Buddy the Elf Day. We, we all should be doing this, okay? You head it from the front of church. Everybody needs to do this. On December 18th, you pick up the phone and you say, Buddy the Elf, what's your favorite color? But we celebrate all manner of strange things in our culture, don't we? We can celebrate things like Buddy the Elf and movies and culture and things like that. We can celebrate family. We celebrate our success in business and our professions. We celebrate our kids and the successes that they have. And I don't think that this is just because it's a fun thing to do. I think it's because deep down in the DNA of every human being, we've been created to celebrate. We have been created to be the kind of people that let our joy out. If we go back to Genesis 1 and we look at the story of the beginning of all things, we see that God creates us in his own image. It says in Genesis 1:27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You and I have been created for the express purpose of imaging, projecting and reflecting what God is like to the world, to the universe. Everything about us was intentioned to send out a message of who God is, what he's like. And within that first narrative of the Bible, what do we learn about what God is like as we read the story of creation? We read how God creates each day, and after every day, he stops, he pauses, and he says, this is good. He outwardly expresses the joy that he has in his creation. When he sets the stars in the sky, when he fills the land with animals, when he breathes the breath of life into man, he says, this is good. In fact, he finishes the whole seven days by saying, this is very good. He's a God who celebrates. He's expressing his joy, right? Sometimes we get this picture in our minds that God is this grumpy kind of old man that's just really critical. But actually, the God of the Bible is a God filled with joy who loves to express his joy. If we go throughout the rest of the Old Testament, every time God moves in the history of his people, he calls them to celebrate. He shuts everything down. He says, get everybody together. Let's sing, let's dance, let's eat food, let's celebrate. And even into the New Testament, when Jesus comes, the Son of God, the image of the invisible God walking amongst us. Where do we most often find Jesus? Where does he spend his time? At celebrations. Finding people to celebrate with, to eat with, to rejoice with. Did you know that Jesus' enemies accused him of being a glutton and a drunkard? That he ate too much and drank too much. Now, though he was not those things, I understand why those were accusations made against him. Because he loved being with people, eating meals, celebrating, laughing, dancing. Jesus is the most joyful person who has ever lived. And so that should be a model to us because if we are created to image God, if our purpose in this world is to project and reflect what God is like, then we too should be joyful people. People who express our joy and love to celebrate. A much wiser and poetic theologian than me once summarized the purpose of man this way. He said, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. How many of us could say that our idea of God, our idea of what he made us for is to enjoy him? Not to feel condemned by him, not to feel burdened by him, not to feel pressured by him, but to enjoy him, to take joy in who he is and what he's given to us. Sometimes I think that we find all of our joy in everything except 
God. We love to celebrate so many things in this world, so many things that are not God. And it's not to say that these things are bad, but if we are celebrating them over and without God, then we are missing out on what is the source of the greatest joy. When we celebrate sports, when we celebrate our family, when we celebrate our professions, when we sing and we dance and we do that over and against and without God, we're missing out on what we could really be enjoying. I'd be avoiding, I think, a major issue in our culture if I didn't say and talk about this morning how one of the things that we have come to celebrate most often is politics now. We celebrate and we share our joy when our political heroes rise to the top. And we share our joy when our political enemies fall down to the bottom. Imagine if we celebrate our joy in God as much as we do those other things. Imagine if when we celebrated those other things, we did them with a view to how they pull us towards God or show us God or reflect God to this world. What if we decided that all of the celebrations in our life were gonna be an opportunity to image God to the world? What would that picture look like? What would it say God is like? Don't let God, don't let Jesus become the last lit thing on your list of things to celebrate. Don't give him the spare time. Don't give him what's left over. Find the time and the ways that you can celebrate him in every day and every moment because he's worth it. See, God has not only created us to celebrate, he has called us to celebrate. He's called us to celebrate. I'm often told by my wife that when I get older, I'm gonna be a curmudgeon grumpy old man. And this is usually because I'm most often complaining about things going on that uh, there's no reason to be complaining about. Uh, I'm that guy that when I see someone turning around in my driveway, I have to go over by the can and, and suspicious, suspiciously look at them and be like, what are they doing? What's going on here? You know, or that guy that's like, close the cans. Don't let anyone knock on our door. We don't wanna be friends with them. I'm a little bit antisocial because I think sometimes I'm celebration challenged because I don't always take joy in the things around me. And so that's why my wife thinks I'm gonna be grumpy one day. But, alas, don't worry, because this is a nation of grumpy people. (laughs) We are filled with people who like to complain about things, and I'm gonna prove it to you this morning. I'm gonna prove to you that there are people all throughout this country finding all kinds of things to be grumpy and complain about, things not to celebrate. For example, Marvin Russell, tweets out to us, nothing bugs me more than watching a DVR'd show and forgetting to fast forward through the commercials. (laughs) Gosh, what a miserable life. (laughs) Matt Solis tells us, ever since Netflix changed the next episode's starting time to five seconds, I always watch the next episode. Well, what a burden to bear. (laughs) Jaggy tells us, I have a paper cut on my iPad finger. Every tweet is agony, but I persist bravely. And then one more, I looked cute today and had no one to take pics of my out. Oh, wait, this one's mine, actually. <laughs> See, there's all these different ways that we can be curmudgeon we can be grumpy, and we can take our attention off the things in our life that we have to celebrate. You see, celebration really is a question of attention. There's lots of things in this life that can cause us to be downcast, to be discouraged. But celebration, the discipline of celebration, is about shifting our attention and finding our joy in Christ. If we go back to that story of Nehemiah, Nehemiah's story is a story about God's changing the attention of his people, giving them a call to celebrate. In Nehemiah 8, we read this. Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. And And then he said to them, go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine. And send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and send portions and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. God has called you and I to be celebrators. He has called us to shift our attention off the things that are not as they are or could be and onto the story that he is writing, onto the things that he is doing. At this particular point in the history of the people of Israel, they have come back to Jerusalem after a long time. 
Nehemiah himself was working in another king's court. And he feels this call of God in his life to go back to Jerusalem, back to this city that had been ransacked, that had been abandoned, that had been broken. To bring God's people back together and to rebuild the walls of the city and worship there together as God's people. So they come back to Jerusalem. They rebuild the walls. Everything is going back to the way it was. And when they gather, Nehemiah and Ezra, two leaders, they get together and they decide to read scripture. They read the law of God, our Old Testament. And as this story is read to them, the people begin to weep and they begin to grieve, they begin to mourn. It's a strange thing to see in the midst of what was happening. The reason that the people are mourning and weeping is because they've heard the words of God's law. They've heard the story of God and they see two things in that story. When they look at God's great story and the design that he had for people, they see first of all that they are not the people that they should be. They have not loved their neighbors the way that they should have. They have not honored God and loved God the way that they were meant to. And second of all, the world around them is not the world that it was created to be either. There is heartbreak, there is suffering, there is pain, there is loss. And so as the people hear what God created this world to be, and then they see the reality of the world in which they live and the lives which they are living, they're brought to tears. They're discouraged. Their attention is on what is broken. But Nehemiah and Ezra say, stop. Though we could weep today, though we could cry today, we're gonna do something different. We're gonna celebrate. Because we are gonna take our attention off the things that are broken, and we're gonna put our attention on the things that are being made new. We're gonna take our attention off the things that we don't have, and we're gonna put it on the God that we do have. He is so good to us, he is so faithful to us, that he alone is a reason to celebrate, even in the midst of all the things that are broken in this world. Nehemiah and Ezra are not telling the people to do this in ignorance of the things that are broken and not the way that they should be. They're doing it in spite of those things because God is the source of their joy. Because God is worth celebrating in every season. They call the people not only to celebrate in their own lives, but say, find everyone in this city who doesn't have food, who doesn't have wine to celebrate, and I want you to invite them into this celebration with you. We want to make it so that no one in this city today is grieving or mourning, so that everyone in this city, men, women, children, can celebrate the joy of our Lord. Celebrate the joy of the God who's rebuilding us because that's what was happening. They'd come back to Jerusalem. The walls had been rebuilt. God was changing their story from one of brokenness into one of restoration. You see, that wall, what it represented in that culture and for that people was security and safety. When they had that wall, they knew that they were in a place where they could dwell and grow and thrive. And so God bringing them back and rebuilding that wall was a sign to them of how he was restoring security to them. And for you and I today, because of Jesus, because of the blood that he shed on the cross, God is restoring to us a sense of security and safety because no longer are we judged by the holiness of our own lives, but we are judged by Christ. No longer are we having to strive for God's affection and his love and his enjoyment of us. He's given it to us freely as a gift of grace through Christ. These people come back, they're also given a community. God's restoring a community to them. They were spread out all across the Middle East and Nehemiah and Ezra bring the people back together to be a family again, to be a people again, to dwell and worship together again. Well, in Christ, you and I have been knit into the family of God. Today, we sit in a room full of people with different stories, different backgrounds from different places, but together we have been made family by God. And I know that the church doesn't always do a great job. We are flawed, we are sinful, we are broken. We don't love one another always the way that we should. But God has knit us together and day by day is changing us and growing us to do that better. He has given us a people and a place that is never gonna go away because he's never gonna go away. And just like Nehemiah and Ezra called the people to invite others into their celebration, to find those who went celebrating them and bring them in, so too are you and I, as followers and disciples of Jesus, called to invite everyone around us into the celebration of what God is doing, how he is changing the story of this broken world. He's called us to go out and to find the resources in our life that we can share with others. How can we give our food, our wine to others so that we can invite them into the celebration? How can we share the story of what God has done in our lives? How he has changed us, transformed us. 
Jesus' good friend Peter said in his first letter, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Peter's word to us is that you and I were created anew in Christ to draw people into a celebration, to proclaim the excellencies of the God who has moved us from darkness into light. Christians should be the most celebratory pe people on the face of the earth because we have been so loved, so celebrated, so restored. You see, God's message to us in his son Jesus is the same message of Nehemiah and Ezra in that day. It's don't weep. Don't grieve. Don't mourn. There's good news. Good news of a God who is willing to tangibly, really change things in this world, give you himself, make himself known, so that even in the darkest moments and the hardest days, you have a reason to celebrate. As we'll quote from Randy Alcorn, I, I had to share with you because it was so good. How much different would it be if people looked at the church less as a group of always critical, always complaining, always feeling persecuted, bunch of curmudgeons? What if we as believers were known as the people of celebration and gladness and the place of feasting? I think one of the biggest barriers for people outside of Christianity to belief in our good news that has been given to us is that sometimes we just don't enjoy our God. Sometimes we aren't inviting people into a celebration. Sometimes we live up to this stereotype that Christians are grumpy, critical, downcast. I've done that. Sometimes we are all celebration challenged, but God is calling us to change. God is calling us to celebrate, to be a people who outwardly express the joy that we have been given, to take our attention off the things that are broken and put our attention on the things that God is making new. Because celebration is not just about today. Celebration is not just about today, it is about that day. It is about where we are headed together. God is preparing us to celebrate. In Revelation 19, we're told in starting in verse six, I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty pearls of thunder crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, fine linen bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. The beginning of God's story is a celebration, a celebration of God over his creation, its goodness, over the image that he placed in us. And the end of God's story that we are told so far is going to be a celebration a celebration of the saints coming together and finally joining with Jesus, having every tear wiped away, every brokenness wiped away, everything that ails us and burdens us and challenges us in our celebration swept away so that for the first time in eternity, all of us will celebrate like we never have before. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. One of my favorite moments in all of scripture, promise given to us by Jesus himself of what awaits those of us that hope in his blood, that hope in what he has done for us. We're told that it's granted to the bride. And in Revelation, this symbolic picture is of Jesus and his bride, his bride being the collected church, all of those that have trusted in his name, all those who have followed him. And it said that that bride will be dressed in bright white linen. The Bible's way of saying that everything that we have lost, everything that darkens us will be swept away, that we will be restored, we will be made new, ready to celebrate. And this is why we are preparing. This is what we are preparing to celebrate. See, the good news of Jesus, though it absolutely changes today and gives us a joy right now, is so much more than that because it is also giving us a joy for tomorrow. It's not just about the joy we're experiencing right now, it's the hope that we have been given of the future day to celebrate. This is what we are inviting people to. When the world sees us celebrate, 
It's not just seeing our joy in God right now. It's seeing the hope that we have in all that he will accomplish at the end of all things. I want you to imagine with me this morning. Let's say that you won the lottery. Let's say you won the greatest jackpot in the history of the lottery, billions upon billions of dollars. Would you wait until you actually collected all of that cash to celebrate? Or would the instant that you are told that you have the winning ticket, would you rejoice? Would you call your mom and dad? Would you call your friends and say, I've won? Would you break out champagne immediately? Knock on your neighbor's doors and say, come around, you'll never believe it. Would you even start thinking about the ways that you could be more generous that instant because you know what's coming for you. You know what you have now inherited, what's been given to you. See, the promise that Jesus has left us with is of that day, is of what's coming for us, what he's prepared for us in advance. And just like that lottery ticket is a guarantee of what's coming for you and therefore changes your life in the present, So too is the hope of everything that's coming for us. We know what God has secured for us. We know what he's purchased for us. So it should work its way backwards because of that hope and change our life to celebrate now. To celebrate now because even though we are not there yet, we know it's coming. And the truth is, is that if you were a lottery winner, in most cases, lottery winners burn through that cash and things don't work out for them. But here's the good news for us, is that we know our promise, our inheritance, is not something that we can possibly burn through. It is set for us in eternity forever. It is infinite because it is Jesus himself, God. See, this is greater than a lottery. This is greater than any other prize we could win, any other gift we could be given. This is what is waiting for us. We should start thinking differently about how we're using our money right now, how we're using our time right now. Who can we invite to celebrate? Parents, how can you celebrate the good news of who Jesus is with your kids? How can you invite them and tell them all the good things that he's doing, the ways that he's answering prayers? How can you show your children that you take joy in Jesus? Students, how can you share with the students in your schools and your colleges how you take joy in Jesus? How can you share your story of faith, your questions, your doubts? How can you show them that you are finding joy in this story? How can you invite people on the fringes, those that feel left out, and invite them to celebrate with you, to enjoy life beside you? How can we make every celebration that we go through, whether it's a Bears Packers games, whether it's the birth of a new baby, whether it is weddings, whether it is birthdays, whatever it is, how can we turn those celebrations to be pointers, to be reflections of the celebration that we're heading towards. When I think about that idea of using celebration to picture what's coming, I can't help but think about two friends of mine, Ali and Jonathan. I've got a picture of Ali and Jonathan here with their little boy, Jaden. Some of you know Ali, she's the worship leader at our Mill Creek campus. Jonathan was uh, a mentor to me. He was actually the middle school pastor before I was. And here in these pictures, they are celebrating the adoption of their son, Jaden, just this week. And I love this celebration because their adoption was actually several months ago. This was just the finalization of it. And Jonathan Ali said, we want to get together with all of our friends, all of our family, and we want to talk about our son, Jaden. We want to celebrate our son, Jaden. But not only that, we want to celebrate how Jaden has showed us what our God is like. How this little boy's sweet little life has pointed us towards the love our God has for us. So we got together, we ate cake and we laughed and we all got to hold Jaden and say hi to him. And then Jonathan stood up there and shared the story of those that around them that had gathered from the church and loved them, supported them, provided for them so that they could adopt their son. How God had met with him and his wife, how he, Jonathan and Ali were held together through all, all the time of waiting for their son because of the joy of God because of the joy that God gave them and his love for them, his promises to them. And then my favorite moment that I'll never forget is Ali held her son and said, in my arms, I am holding the faithfulness of God. I'm holding this tangible, visible little boy that represents all that God has done up to this point. And this became a celebration far more than that wonderful little boy. It became a celebration of all that God was doing in their life to restore to redeem, to show off, to tell people about himself. And there were people in that room who attended a celebration for a little boy and got far more than they bargained for because they saw a celebration of a savior who changes people's stories, who's changing people's lives, who sets little boys like that in families, who takes parents longing for children and gives them a son. 
See, all of us, you and I, are all adoptees into God's family. He's adopted us through his son Jesus, through his shed blood. We've been brought into a family. And we are going to celebrate one day that adoption, all together, every face, every one of us, every son and daughter that God has claimed for himself and brought into his kingdom, we will gather together as family and friends and we will sing and we will dance and we will celebrate all that God has done for us. And we will see him, not through a veil dimly as we are told by Paul in the Bible, but we will see him clearly. We will see Jesus' face like we've never seen it before. And all these notions that we have that sometimes we just can't shake that he is some grumpy, curmudgeon critical old man will pass away because we'll see him as the father who loves us and loves to share his joy. We'll see this joyful father sing and dance. It will be the most beautiful picture that any of us has ever seen. We will see and touch all of us the faithfulness of God. Dear church, if we don't celebrate, if we don't make this a discipline in our life, then the world will not see the joy that is available in Jesus. That is why he has called us to this. This is why he is preparing us for this. May it be said of us, as it was said of the people of God in Nehemiah's day, they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy, the women and children also. The joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. May our rejoicing and our celebrations go far beyond us. May they be head far away so that this world will see the joy of Jesus. We're gonna wrap up our series today with one more challenge. As you leave today, you're gonna to have the opportunity to pick up a balloon. Balloons are a symbol for all of us of celebration. We put them up in happy times. So this week, we're gonna take that balloon. I want you to blow it up and place it somewhere in your home where you go past regularly. And remember this week, all of the reasons that you have to celebrate Jesus. Jesus who has bought you, who has forgiven you, who has redeemed you, who is changing your story. Perhaps during a devotional time this week, you can sit down and use some of the disciplines we've already talked about, gratitude, remembrance, and reflect on the ways that God has brought joy into your life. Perhaps as a family, you can gather around a dinner table this week and pass the balloon around and say to one another, this is the way that I see Jesus' joy in you. This is the way that you have brought me joy through Jesus. This is the way that God has answered prayers. This is the way that God has been faithful and find those ways to celebrate. And do that not simply so that you can go through some religious exercise, but do it so that you can remind your own heart and take your attention off the things that are broken and put them on the things that have been made new. And so that our neighbors in the Tri-City area, all of our communities would hear our rejoicing from far away. Would you pray with me as we close this morning? Father, you are so much more joyful than we realize. You are the name above all names and you are the king of kings because unlike every other religious figure in history, every other false God, you, Lord Jesus, the true God, are a God of great joy who has made your joy known to us, who has given your joy to us in your son and has called us to invite others into that joy. Lord, may we as a church, we as your people, we as those who want to follow you become a people of celebration. May we become known for being people of feasting, of rejoicing, and for singing so that the world may see and know who you are and what you've done. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.